All right, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today, Matthew chapter 6. And by the way, if you would like to take notes, I know I can't really like make you, you're at your house, but if you'd like to take notes, we've provided a way to do that. If you go to lovesiler.com and you click on church at home, there's a PDF for you to download if you'd like to print it off and, and take handwritten notes. Uh, but you can also follow along with the sermon outline in the browser there, uh, and you can punch in some notes for yourself and then send it to yourself afterwards. For me, it kind of helps me keep up uh, and helps me remember things that God is speaking uh, while we are diving into his word because that's what he does. And we want this message, all of our messages, to be able to be used by you. Uh, to the, uh, we want you to be able to walk, get up off your couch or wherever you are and put this message and this sermon in to practice. And so we started last week a new series called Teach Us to Pray. Uh, it's a it's a question that Jesus's followers asked him, um, and many of the, his followers today, many church people, uh, many believers and non-believers alike, uh, have have wondered that same thing. How do we pray? What is it? How how can I make sure that I am praying the right way? And so Jesus laid out for us sort of a template for how we should pray, and he did that through this thing called the Lord's Prayer. Now, the thing about the Lord's Prayer, it's, it's pretty popular. You may have heard of it. Uh, even if you didn't go to church, it gets repeated a lot around our society in this area. And uh, it is more than just uh, some magic words. It is, a, it is a template. It's a way of thinking about prayer uh, that's going to help you be more effective and closer to God. And so we're going to jump in for the next couple messages and, and, and go line by line to figure out uh, how we are to pray. And so let's go ahead and read that whole Lord's Prayer. It's in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to be reading, I believe this is the NIV starting in verse 9. Yours may look a little different. It all means the same thing, though. Uh, and we started off last week, before we jump into verse 9, we started last week by talking about a couple ideas, a couple provisos or uh, prerequisites that Jesus told us before we start praying, we need to make sure we have these attitude adjustments. And if you go back to our YouTube video from last week, I, I would encourage you to go back and watch that. But for just the main points for the sake of today, uh, Jesus told us to make sure that we are humble and trust worthy or that we trust him and that we are humble. He didn't say those exact words, but that's what he meant when he said, hey, when you pray, don't get up in front of everybody and make a big deal about it. Go to your closet uh, and pray to your God. Um, and and that, that just because you say nice words and just because you repeat something or say it louder or pray longer, that doesn't necessarily make your prayer any better. These things called vain repetitions, where we just think that we have to, to say the right incantation the right way for us to be heard by God. The problem with, with those things are is that that takes the focus and the power out of God's hands. And so we should be humble. Um, we should not be a show off when we pray. And we should remember and trust him that even if we don't really know what we're praying about, he knows what we're praying about. So that's the general idea as we head into Matthew chapter 6. Let's begin with verse 9. It says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, or your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, or yours may say trespasses, as we have also forgiven those who trespass against us, or who are our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, you may have heard it worded a little differently. Uh, if you went to something like a Methodist church, you may have had things uh, added to the end of it. All that is good and fine, but from what we can tell, uh, going back to the earliest manuscripts, this is how, this is what Jesus taught us to pray. And I want to take this line by line over the next five messages. And I know you're going, holy cow, how are you going to take five sermons out of basically five sentences? Well, there's so much because this is not, this is not just the only thing that you can pray. This is a template. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a framework uh, for how God wants us to communicate with him. So today I want to focus on our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
That's the beginning of this Lord's Prayer. It's kind of an opening address to God. And I think it's important that we don't skip over that um, because we need to remember who we're talking to. You know, so many times we forget and we, we, come, we come in thinking and talking to God just exactly like we would be talking to somebody else. And there's, there's something to be said for that familiarity, but it's so easy to forget who we're actually talking to, that our prayers are a different kind of conversation than the conversations, the chit-chat that we have with each other. And so uh, I want to just break this line down from our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Or if you're reading the NLT, may your name be kept holy. So let's first look at our Father. This is, I think, the most mind-blowing part of uh, the Lord's Prayer and, and the fact of our relationship with God is we get to call him Father. We get to call the creator of the universe, the one that holds and sustains this world that we live in, we get to call him Dad. And God could have chosen to call himself the heavenly uncle, or the heavenly grandpa, or the heavenly neighbor. He didn't. He said, I am your heavenly father. And that means that he wants us to draw some things and learn some things through the father and child relationship. And so when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about the fact that, that dads, they secure and they fight for their children. If you're a dad, then you have this natural built-in instinct to protect your kids. And it takes something really sinful to take you out of that, that, that mode of responsibility. Um, but that's the same for God, too. That's why in Psalm 32, 7 through 8, uh, the psalmist says, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. This was a man at the end of his rope, fearing for his life, and he ran to his heavenly Father, And it reminds me of those times where a a kid runs into their dad's arms because that's the one place that they felt safe. And they can't wait to unload on them and, 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 and just be in their arms. And that's because dads, they fight for their children. They're protective and they secure their children. And that's the type of relationship God wants to have with us. We have the ability when no one else is there for us, God is. And we can hide in his arms. But, you know, the the less fun or uh, less encouraging side of that coin is the fact that dads also discipline their children. They, that's probably the least favorite thing about being a dad, uh, in my opinion, is we have to discipline our kids. And our Heavenly Father disciplines us as well. That's why Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says, my son, don't despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof. Reproof just means correction. For the Lord reproves him who he loves and as a father, the son in whom he delights. What he's saying is, listen, God loves you. And so because he loves you, he disciplines you. And so when you pray to God, your father, you may be in the middle of discipline because your sin and your stupidity and your bad decisions have have incurred the discipline of your heavenly father. And so that is not because God hates you. It's actually because he loves you. And this is what the, uh, the writer of Proverbs said. Just, just like a, a father would discipline their son, God disciplines us. But here's the cool thing. One of the things I've noticed being a dad uh, for almost 10 years now is that every time I have to discipline my kids, right? It's not fun. You would think that they would be mad. You would think that they would hate me afterwards. But, but every time I discipline them, I follow it up with a big old hug, with a big old kiss. I wipe the tears from their face. I make sure that they understand uh, how much I love them. Um, and you know what? I've never been turned away from a hug. You would think if someone just, uh, just punished you, just uh, said something that hurt your feelings or hurt your behind that you wouldn't want to hug them. But my kids have never, and I think most kids, they, they would hug you after they're being disciplined. And, and that's the same way with God because God has, just because God disciplines us, uh, just like just because a parent disciplines us doesn't mean that he's lost that, that love and that security uh, and that, that protective part of his character. But 
the the other thing I want you to understand about our Heavenly Father, dads, dads spend time with their children. They spend time with their children, or at least a dad should. We know that all dads don't always hit the mark, but Psalm 27, 4 says this. Uh, the, King David said, the only, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek the most. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for wisdom like his son Solomon. He just asked to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Right? David just wanted to spend time with his heavenly father. And the thing is, I know some of you with, with maybe grown-up kids are going, I feel like my kids are going to dwell in the house of their parents their whole life, get out of here and get a job. But God works a little bit differently than that. He's never tired of us. He doesn't put us off when we go to talk to him so to let him finish his show or finish what he's reading in the paper or leave me alone, let me go work in my shed. That's not how our Heavenly Father works. He loves spending time with you. In fact, some of you are wondering, well, why don't I feel like I'm close to God? I don't feel like he's my Heavenly Father. Well, the answer is in James 4, 8. It says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. God doesn't put us off. God doesn't say, hold on, let me get to you later. Let me work extra at my job and, and not spend time with you like I should. No, he, he, if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And that makes this true, that, that you're as close to God as you want to be. It's not that God is elusive and he's running and trying to play hard to get. He wants to spend time to you. And so if you will draw near to him, he'll draw near to you and you can be as close as you want to be. And so we can't complain about an out of touch God when our prayers are out of practice. Prayer is one of the best ways for us to get close to our Heavenly Father. And that's why Jesus started this, this uh, template of prayer, this ideal prayer, recognizing that He is our Father and, and what that relationship reflects uh, about Him. And so he's, he's our Father, but He's also our Father in heaven. This is one of the many places like Psalm 115.3 that says, our, our God is in heaven. He does as he pleases. God is in a place that is not here. Now, he's also here. Proverbs 15, 3 says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch over what is evil and what is good. So because he's God and he is not like us, he can be in heaven and he can be here. So know that that's true. But, but I know you're probably going, okay, so why, are we, why is this important? Why do we need to drop the pin on where God is? Why do we need to know? Uh, because heaven reminds us of some things. It, heaven reminds us, one, that this is not it for us. This is not all there is. If you're a child of God, you have something better on the way. Hebrews 13, 14 says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking for a home yet to come. You see, when you're at the end of your rope, and that rope is fraying, and you, you feel like you're, you're in a place that you can't get out of, we can lean on the fact that our Father is in heaven, is in a place that he has made perfectly well for us, and that one day, because of his son Jesus, we can be there too. We can get out of this dumpster fire of a world and go to a place that was, that was meant to be. Um, and so that's why Psalm 30, verse Five may apply to us because weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. We can hold fast to those promises. And so when I pray and I say, my father in heaven, I, I get this picture of him high above. Now realizing that we're not just like going straight up between the moon and Jupiter and there's heaven, but, but God is on a, a higher plane of existence. Uh, and, and here's, I'm reminded that, you know, I, I have a better view of, let's say, the football field. Remember that thing called football that we used to get to play and watch? Um, foot, uh, I can see more that's going on on a field from a high position, can't you? Right? Whether, whether you're, you're in, down there and you, you see a ref miss a call that the whole crowd saw, it's, it's because it's, sometimes it's easier to see from a high level. And, and what we need to understand about that, uh, it's not a perfect metaphor, but the fact is that, that God doesn't miss anything. 
When we say our Father in heaven, we are, are, are reminding ourselves of the fact that, that God is seeing everything that's going on. And that all the, the tragedy, all the injustice, all the struggles, all the good and all the bad are not missed by him. And he will judge and he will bless accordingly. Also, heaven reminds us, though, uh, that we shouldn't always get God. That we shouldn't always understand everything that he does. That's one of the things that, that uh, keeps me humble. The fact that I, I'm not going to get everything that he says. Isaiah 55 tells us, uh, my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Don't worry about not being able to have every answer to every question that you have. Some of you let that that those questions turn into doubt, which turns into all fear that turns into a lack of belief and it, and it ruins uh, your peace. Realize that God is in heaven and he knows more and he has a bigger and better plan than we could ever process or figure out on our own. But also, not only is he our father and not only is he in heaven, but it says, hallowed be your name. Or again, other translations say, may your name be kept holy. And the reason that this is important, because this is something that kind of flew over my head when I first learned the Lord's Prayer as a kid, because I'm like, that, that just sounds very high and mighty. You know, I, I grew up in different churches where they wore robes, and, and I always felt like, like there was some high and mighty thing there that these preachers were talking, and I realized that, that God is actually the one that is high and mighty. He's, he's holy. And so, yes, he's our heavenly Father, but he's up in heaven because he's holy, because he's otherworldly, because he, holy, which just means set apart from all the lesser things that would contaminate and, and, and ruin his holiness. That's why Jesus was necessary, because Isaiah 57, 15 says, the high and lofty one who sits, who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high and holy place with those spirits who are contrite and humble. Contrite just means they, they know that they've messed up and they want that forgiveness. You see, sometimes we get a little fast and loose. We think that we can talk to God like we talk to our buddies. But, but sometimes we need to realize that God is something on a whole nother level. That's why Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Gods with a lowercase g, all the imitators, all the not gods. Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is, no one is like our God. And that's why the truth is, God's name is to be kept in high esteem. We've got to be careful with the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ. That's why uh, it crawls all over me when I hear someone drop a GD or, or I, I hear a kid stub their toe and then use the name of Jesus like an expletive because that's not what it's meant for. Their name, God's name is meant to be high and holy. And I know some of you are like, well, I would never say that. You may say all the other ones, but you ain't going to say GD. But you realize that when you frivolously throw God around, like, well, God said, told me this. God told me that. Which, by the way, I do believe God speaks. But we have to be very careful when to, to, before we go telling people, God told me this. Right? Because it's not infallible. That's not uh, like the word of God where God told his people certain things. We, we, don't, we don't get that level of discernment from him. So well, we got to be careful. We don't got to just drag God's name and, his, and therefore his reputation through the mud when we use it uh, in a way that doesn't put it in high esteem. And here's the thing. That motivation right there, I know that might not seem important to you, but it's important to God. In Jeremiah 14, 7, he cries out, Although our sins testify against us, do something, Lord, for the sake of your name. Jeremiah says, look, I know we don't deserve this. I know we don't deserve your help, but not for our sake, but for the sake of your name so that people will, will see how great you are. Would you save us? Psalm 106, 
8 says, Yeah, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. Look, I know that Jesus, so for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that none of us will have to perish, but we can have eternal life. I know that that was for us, but that wasn't only for us. It's in part because God saved us for his name's sake. He saved us to display his goodness to the rest of the world. And I know that deep down you think that's egocentric. You think that that's arrogant, that that God's just being, just hogging the spotlight. But the fact is he's the only one that deserves the spotlight. All of us, when when we do that, it's because we're not we're not God. That's the reason it's wrong. And so, the 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 fact is that if God was not so passionate about His name and His reputation being held in high esteem, we would be destined for hell, because that is in part what motivated Him to to provide the sacrifice of Jesus for us. And so that's why Psalm 145, 21 says, let every creature bless his holy name forever and ever. See, that's why we're here in the first place so that we can bless his name so that we can sing his praises. Y'all realize that's like, all we're going to be doing in heaven, everything that we do, uh, believer, for w- whether it's singing a song, whether it's doing a job, whether it's creating something, it's all going to be done for his worship and to make God look good. So God is, and you're going, well, why is this so important? Why is his holiness so important. Why in Psalm 96, 9 does it say, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, tremble before him all the earth? Why, why is that important? Well, you see, God's holiness shines the light on our sinfulness. When you put God's holiness next to our dirtiness, it, it, it shows our need to be made holy. You see, God is, has chosen us to uh, make into he made us all in his image and we're supposed to be become holy like him and so god has made us this he has he has shown us for who we truly are so that we will see our need for him so that we will accept uh, the sacrifice that he offers us through his son jesus and so listen you can start out saying uh, you can pray all you want but but if, the reason that Jesus started the Lord's Prayer this way is because we needed to have the right picture and the right view of who we're praying to. We're praying to our Father, the one that loves us, the one that protects us and provides for us. But not just that, but he's, he is in heaven and his name is to be kept holy. We're supposed to see him uh, as best we can for his glory, for who he truly is, and that will humble us. That, by the way, when we see God for who he is, that makes our prayers that much more potent because we know what he's capable of. We know what we deserve, and so we're able to pray to him like we should. And so that's the, the, the first line here, and that's what I want you to understand about the Lord's Prayer so far. And so what we're going to do, we're going to stop here for today. I'm going to give you a couple discussion questions. They're going to be up on the screen. You feel free to pause it afterwards. Uh, but again, the goal and the intent of these messages is is for you to, to think through some of the truths that we've shared with you this morning, to go back and find those Bible verses and, and dig in a little deeper. We hope you'll do that throughout the week with us. But let me end today. Obviously, we're We're trying to learn how to pray, so uh, let's end in prayer, and we'll let you go about your Sunday. Let's pray. Oh, God, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you're our dad. We're so thankful that on Mother's Day, you give the, the perfect picture of what a parent is supposed to be. God, we, we thank you for how close you are and how, how you would come down from on high in your holiness and and spend time with us. And we thank you that you you haven't left us here in this world, that that there's a a bigger and a better plan for us and that one day we get to spend that, that eternity with you if we are in your son. 
And Lord, help us to keep your name holy. Help us to not drag it through the mud with our our actions and our attitudes and the way we live our lives. Lord, uh, help us to keep your name holy. To While we can be close to you and while we can uh, run to you for comfort, also realize that you are holy. You are good. You are far beyond us. Uh, and we should never forget that uh, because we should lean on that power. We should lean not on our understanding, but on yours. So, Lord, help us to, to work this out Uh, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because of who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we hope you have a great week. If you have any questions about salvation, again, God is not, God is everyone's creator. He's not everyone's father. You have to be adopted into the family of faith. And so we would love to for you to follow up with us, go to lovesiler.com and click contact us. uh, And and we will, we will talk through this with you. Uh, We hope that you uh, will get together with those that you're meeting with uh, and do those discussion questions and talk more about that. If you're by yourself, you can do these discussion questions with whoever's in the chat. Uh, But we hope that this message will change your week.